Good morning. We wish you a warm welcome here on this 21st Sunday after Trinity, and we, as we also celebrate our Heritage Sunday. And of course, uh, you're all welcome to join us downstairs after the service for our chili chicken noodle luncheon. I'll try to remember to have a prayer after the closing hymn so that we can just uh, go on down there and uh, start, start the meal. Um, but uh, just a few other notes about our service today. We're pulling out the old red hymnal, uh, a favorite of many, and certainly I think the precursor uh, in many wonderful ways to what we have now, the LSB. Um, and uh, there's just a few notes about this service, uh, and I wrote many of them in the announcements. So uh, please note that there's going to be a few changes from maybe what we're used to in our Divine Service 3 from the Lutheran S Service book. Um, but other than that, I think uh, it'll be something that many of you are probably very much used to. This is the hymnal I grew up with uh, in rural Nebraska, and um, it certainly has a wonderful place, a uh, dear place in my heart. Um, however, I've never, other than last year, uh, led this service uh, from the TLH uh, as a pastor. It's always been uh, following my dad um, and uh, you know, following it as a, as a lay person. Uh, so this will be uh, interesting, and hopefully uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, forgetting of things like Hurricane Milton's name and so forth. So, With that being said, um, yeah, see our announcements for everything else coming up uh, in the weeks ahead, especially Trunk or Treat this Saturday and the youth night that follows. So um, we uh, begin uh, our opening hymn. Actually, really quickly, all the hymns I picked are only in the TLH. We don't have any of these hymns that we're singing, I believe, in our LSB. So that's one small thing I wanted to add, too. So we'll sing, In Thee, Lord, Have I Put My Trust, hymn 524.
215, we stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And the Confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now turn to the intro in your insert. We speak it responsibly by half verse. The whole world is in thy power, O Lord, King Almighty. There is no man that can gain save thee. For thou hast made heaven and earth and all the wondrous things under the heaven. Thou art Lord of all. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Establish thy work unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Glory.
be with you. Let us pray the collect all together. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in good works, to the glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. I will note before we have the readings that these are all from the King James Version. The Old Testament reading for the 21st Sunday after Trinity is written in the first chapter of Genesis, beginning at the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the water from the waters. And God made the firmament, and it divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and those in the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, 
Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. and the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which in the, in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Here endeth the Old Testament reading. We continue with the gradual. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The epistle is from Ephesians, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here endeth the epistle.
We stand for the gospel singing the triple alleluia. written in the fourth chapter of St. John, beginning with at the 46th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same time, the same hour, in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed, and his whole house. This is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Here endeth the gospel. Praise be to Christ. We confess our faith according to the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus performed many miracles in a few different ways. Some are by touch, and these are perhaps the, the most interesting in some ways because Jesus doesn't need to touch these individuals, and yet he does. And perhaps the most spectacular is when he touches a man with leprosy. So that's something that should cause him to be leprous. Instead, flows the other direction, and his divine healing flows into the man, and he is healed of leprosy. Sometimes Jesus does miracles that are rather unspoken. We don't think, for example, that Jesus spoke many words over the water in Cana of Galilee as it turned into wine. It's not like he said, water, be wine. All he said was, take some of the water and give it to the master of the feast and let him drink it. And on the way, it turned into wine. Similar thing probably happens with the feed of the 5,000 or the 4,000 when Jesus is multiplying bread and fish. He blesses it, to be sure, but... As he hands it out, it just multiplies, so it can feed many, many people. Sometimes people are even healed by touching the hem of his robe as he is walking by. A woman was healed in that way. But probably some of the most fantastic miracles that Jesus ever did were by the spoken word. Perhaps you remember him calming the sea on the uh, on the Sea of Galilee, simply by saying, peace, be still. And it was still. He raises Lazarus by calling out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, who was dead for four days, came out alive. Some people recognize this, this authority that he had. And in fact, there's a passage in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that tell of a centurion who had a servant who was at death's door. And when Jesus said, I'll come to your house and I'll heal the servant, the centurion said, no, 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 no need for that. You have authority. Just say a word and I believe that it'll happen. And Jesus says, wow, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. That's partly where we're going with our gospel text for today, is that when Jesus speaks a word and heals somebody or does something fantastic, it, it is a, an expression, a, a demonstration of his divine power. That Jesus is the word of God who created all the heavens and the earth. But sometimes it's more important, underneath the surface, is the faith of the people who are hearing that word. Like the centurion, like the disciples on the Sea of Galilee who are just, they're about to die, so they're all crazy, right? They don't have belief, they don't have faith that Jesus could just calm the storm. And here is the highlight of a faith of a nobleman or of an official who comes and asks Jesus to heal his son. And this is a wonderful, wonderful example of faith. This man was a, uh, a royal official in Capernaum. Perhaps he was working for King Herod. His son was ill even at the point of death, and he didn't know where to go. But then he remembered that he had heard about a man who had done a miracle at a wedding in Cana. And it's interesting that what we have here, Jesus doing this miracle, is the second miracle that happened there in Cana. Because this father's faith is remarkable. He is willing to travel from one city to another, probably about 18 to 20 miles, in order to have his son healed. And this is partly why John is called the gospel of faith. He emphasizes these sort of stories. And I think the father can mirror us in some ways or give me an example of us of faith. What about you? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died on the cross and rose again to save you? What proof do you have of his existence? You see, faith in Christ is not merely something of the emotions, though emotions play a part. 
Our faith is not based on popular opinion polls as to what other people around us may or may not believe. Faith in Christ is not based on archaeological evidence, although that evidence certainly can support our faith. But faith in Christ is based on the word of God, the hearing of the gospel. And true saving faith trusts in Jesus and clings to him alone for salvation. And this is the faith that this father, this nobleman, had. He trusted in God despite what was going on around him, especially the illness unto death of his own son. And this faith of the man is important because it points us to when things are happening in our lives of where we can turn to. Because there is certainly a lot, I'm sure, that was going through his mind and, and his emotions. No doctor could help his son. And there may have been a lot that they did for him. We don't know. But it's hard when we, each of us have to admit that there may not be a whole lot that doctors can do for us or our loved ones. Sometimes we even get that news, don't we? I'm sorry. There's nothing more that we can do for your son. Doctors and hospitals today are great blessings. So much has improved in the last 100 years. And indeed, God works through doctors and hospitals to, as he blesses them, as he blesses us through them. And our lives may be prolonged, but we all know that they can only do so much. We can never prevent death from coming. Somehow, in some way, it will come for each one of us. We don't want to hear those words, I'm sorry, there's nothing more that we can do for you. But they may be spoken sometime in our future. And the root of all of this goes back not to Genesis 1 and 2 that we read in our Old Testament reading, but to Genesis 3 and the fall into sin. You see, we all have a sinful nature because Adam and Eve were blessed with a perfect creation, and yet fell to the temptation of the devil. They ate the fruit that they should not have eaten, and so we all have gotten a sinful human nature in us that leads to death. The son of this father had a sinful human nature, and so he, perhaps earlier than normal, was on his deathbed. And our sinful nature within us causes us also to be sick, not just with various illnesses, but sick to the core of who we are. It causes us to say things that we should not say. It causes us to do things that we should not do. And one day, it will cause us to physically die as well. Paul in Romans reminds us the wages of sin is death. None of us are immune from sin, and none of us are immune from death. But... In the midst of this sinful world, in which death seems to reign over all of us, there is hope and there is light. And this father was one of the ones to see that light, even though he heard from reports of a man who turned water into wine, he believed that this man could do much more than just simply what could be a party trick of turning water into wine, that there is something behind this man who could even heal his son. And so the other aspect of this father's faith is that he acts on it by going and asking Jesus to heal his son. Now, he lived in Capernaum, as I mentioned, 18 to 20 miles away. I think it's interesting for us, 18 miles is no problem at all. It may take you out in the country 18 minutes to go somewhere, Perhaps even if you're in a city, it takes a little bit longer. But can you imagine walking 18 miles just to find someone who might be able to heal your son? And then, in your mind, you may even have to bring him back the other 18 miles so that he could see your son and do a miracle. How long would that take for you to walk 18 miles? Perhaps if you're a a young, strong man, you can do it in four to five hours, perhaps. Maybe if you have some aches and pains, it will take all day. And that's what I imagine this man, this father, is doing. Walking, maybe running, for all day to go from Capernaum 
to Cana. And indeed, when he finally finds Jesus in the seventh hour, it probably was close to nighttime. He falls and, and asks him, Jesus, please come to my house and see my son. He's very sick and near death. I heard about you. I believe in you. I, I believe that you can heal my son. Please come. But here is where he doesn't get the response that he expects. And this is perhaps also a lesson that we can take to heart ourselves. Jesus seems to give a cold shoulder to him. He seems to rebuff the official and those around him. Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What does this comment have to do anything with the official's request? He seemed to come believing without seeing. And yet Jesus blames him for wanting to see and believe at the same time? Is Jesus saying no to this official? What does the official do, though? Does he, this official take it as a rebuff, saying, I'm not going to do it because I don't want you to connect faith and sight together? Does he just throw in the towel and walk away from Jesus? No. On the other hand, he simply says, please help my son. What do you do when your prayers are not answered? What do you do when your faith is tested? Do you just throw in the towel and say, well, all of this church stuff and all this praying just doesn't work, so I'm not going to give it a try anymore? These are some of the attacks that the devil has on each one of us. The devil tries different angles of attacking your faith. It might be that he says, do you believe that God really created the world in six days, in six 24-hour days? Our current science says it took billions and billions of years. Come on, no one believes that Bible story anymore. Surely you should believe in evolution and how man are just evolved from apes. That is one attack that Satan may have for us. Another attack that the devil will have is surely salvation couldn't come through something so humble as death on a cross. No God would humble himself like that. Maybe our sinful flesh would say, is God really powerful? If he was, then surely he would have answered your prayer. Or our sinful flesh will aim a little bit more at our faith and say, well, baptism is just plain water and nothing less. Maybe you should take things into your own hands. Will you throw in the towel? Will you doubt God and his word and his many promises? Will you put God to the test demanding that he answer your prayer, and then only will you believe in him? Perhaps like doubting Thomas on the day of the resurrection. There is a battle out there over your soul, over this official soul as well, as he seemed to be rebuffed. Our epistle lesson says that we wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers, against the... Uh, spiritual forces of evil. They all attack God's word and the proclamation of the gospel. They all aim at attacking your soul and causing you doubt and despair. They do not want you to believe in God as your creator, as your redeemer, as your sanctifier. However, what we see in our text here is something that our faith can rest in, which is the word of God that Jesus speaks. And the official, however, or the official, therefore, did not take to heart this attack of the devil on his faith. And when it seemed like Jesus was ignoring him, he simply says, Sir, come down before my child dies. You can see him plead for mercy. We plead for mercy, too. Every Sunday when we say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. These are wonderful words. And Jesus looks at the official and says, Go, your son lives. These are four beautiful words, four words that enlivened the hope in this man's heart. Jesus does not have to travel those 18 miles to do a miracle. He does not have to go into this man's house and lay his hand on his son to heal him. Jesus does it from a distance. Just like that, 
he healed the official's son. I think the walk home may have been another sort of trial for the official. He has to walk home 18 miles, not knowing whether these words that this man said would actually come true. Right? Imagine that. You hear from a man, your son's going to live. And then you have to walk home, maybe running a little bit again, and hoping and praying that that actually is the case. And yet he did so. The text tells us that he did so in faith. He believed all the way home that his son would be healed. And he hears from the servants running back from Capernaum that your son has amended. He is living. He is well. And he asked what hour this happened. It turned out it happened in the same hour when Jesus made that promise to him. The official's son was given life. And we see echoes of the faith, sort of, elsewhere also in the scriptures, especially around the resurrection. You see, this official son was given life, but there was another son who needed to die, the father's only begotten son. On the cross, Jesus died, and he made the righteous payment for our sins there on the cross, for you and for me. Jesus was put in the tomb, but three days later he rose again, and he appeared to his disciples, or at least most of them. However, there was one disciple who was not there, Thomas. Did he believe in the resurrection when he heard by the words of the others that Jesus had appeared to them? No, he did not. Rather, he said, unless I put my fingers in the marks in his hand and in his side, I will surely not believe. Thomas is a little bit of a pragmatist. He wanted to see and believe. He's kind of the opposite of this official asking for healing from his son. But when Jesus does, in a, a week later, appear to him, show him his hands and his side, he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus then says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Faith believes in God's word, despite what our human reason might say. Faith believes that God brought everything into existence simply by his word. It believes that Jesus died and rose again based on the testimony of those who witnessed it, those who wrote down in four gospels what they saw and what they experienced. Faith is always more than what you see. During a baptism, you see water. But the word declares that through that water, God is doing something amazing for that child who is being brought into the church. During holy absolution, faith trusts this word of God that is preached and proclaimed by the pastor. During the Lord's Supper, you see only bread and wine. But faith recognizes the very body and blood of Jesus that is given for you for forgiveness, life, and salvation. You see, when we look out into this world with our eyes of this world, we see things that seem insignificant, that seem full of sin and decay and death. Perhaps when you look in a mirror of God's law, you see a sinner. But when you hear the word of the gospel proclaim that you are a child of God, redeemed by his blood, your eyes of faith ought to believe in that. You see, the royal official left Jesus with just a word. Your son lives. You leave today with a simple word. You are pardoned. You are forgiven. You are justified. You live. You live in Christ. So trust in Jesus. He is the word of God who brought all things into existence in those six days of creation. He is the word who was made flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He is the word who died in the darkness of Good Friday. He is the word who rose again on Easter Sunday to promise you eternal life. He is the word who gives you this life through the waters of baptism. He is the word who sustains your faith. He is the word who feeds you. And he is the word who will one day raise your bodies from the sleep of death. During the journey home, the official believed that his son lives. During your journey, 
not just home here today, but even to your eternal home, you can believe that your body will be raised immortal and incorruptible. For on the last day, Christ will come again, and you will rise with a perfect body and soul. Your prayers for healing in this life will be fully answered on that day, when you will be healed of all your ailments and all that grieves you. But while you remain here on earth, you may live by faith in Christ as your Savior. You live by faith in God's many promises. You live now, and you will live always, for you have God's promise as you are going home today. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for the offertory. and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thee thanks for all thy goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of thy dear Son and for the revelation of thy will and grace. And we beseech thee so to implant thy word in us that in good and honest hearts we may keep it and bring forth fruit by patient, in, by patient continuance in well-doing. Most heartily we beseech thee to rule and govern thy church universal with all his pastors and ministers, that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of thy saving word, whereby faith toward thee may be strengthened, charity increased in us toward all mankind, and thy kingdom extended. Send forth laborers into thy harvest, and sustain those whom thou hast sent, that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people, and the gospel preached in all the world. Grant also health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially to the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this Commonwealth, and to all our judges and magistrates, and endue them with grace to rule after thy good pleasure, to the maintenance of righteousness, and to the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. May it please thee also to turn the hearts of our enemies and adversaries that they may cease their enmity and be inclined to walk with us in meekness and in peace. All who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, especially those who are in suffering for thy names and for thy truth's sake, comfort, O God, with thy Holy Spirit, that they may receive and acknowledge their afflictions as manifestation of thy fatherly will. And although we have deserved thy righteous wrath and manifold punishments, yet we entreat thee, O most merciful Father, remember not the sins of our youth, nor our many transgressions, but out of thine unspeakable goodness, grace, and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger of body and soul. Preserve us from faults and pernicious doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart and despair of thy mercy, and from an evil death. And in every time of trouble, show thyself a very present help, the Savior of all men, and especially of them that believe. Cause all needful fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. Give success to the Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations on land and sea, 
and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, and crown them with thy blessing. Receive, O God, our bodies and souls and all our talents, together with the offerings we bring before thee. For thou hast purchased us to be thine own, that we may live unto thee. Be especially with those who request our prayers. Grant, Connie, Judy, Patty, Bill, Charlie, Guileen, Deborah, Bill, Kathy, Dwayne, Susan, Wes, Suzanne, and Lita. These and whatsoever other things thou wouldst have us ask of thee, O God, grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, thine only Son, our Lord and Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament on page 24. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
dancing they do for the mirrors. strengthen us through the same in faith toward thee and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Oh, Lord. 
invite you to join us uh, downstairs for our, our chili and chicken noodle luncheon. And uh, um, it's been smelling good all morning, so I'm sure we're all looking forward to it. And thanks for the Generations Group for, uh, for putting that on. And we're going to go ahead and have a prayer for the food, so you can go down there and start eating. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have given us a rich feast by coming here to hear your word and receive your sacrament. And we ask that you would bless the rich feast that is uh, prepared for us down below, that it may support our bodies and fill our stomachs. Grant us your grace always, that uh, we may live always more and more in your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.